Well, my name is Alan Graves. My call sign is HE4VA. And I'm going to talk about a amateur radio activity called Summits on the Air. I've been licensed as an amateur radio operator since 1984. And I've been involved with Summits on the Air for 14 months now, since August of 2019. And getting started with Summits on the Air, the best place you can go is to the Summits on the Air website. Best place you can start with Summits on the Air is their website, soda.org.uk. It has all the information on there that you need, and there's so much information to cover. I highly suggest you read all of this at your leisure, but what I'm gonna do tonight is just hit on a few highlights that will help you getting that'll help you get started uh, a whole lot quicker than if you had to delve through all this on your own. So SOTA was designed as an award program and there are three basic ways to participate in SOTA. I'm gonna talk about two tonight. One is a, is a chaser that's communicating to someone who's up on the summit and you can participate as an activator and that's somebody who takes their equipment up to the summit and activates. And they also have a shortwave listener category. So they actually designed SOTA to be all inclusive. You don't even need to be an amateur radio operator to participate in SOTA. But since I'm talking to hams, I'm just gonna talk about chasers, those um, comfortably in their shack or anywhere off the summit, talking to a ham who's activating or those who activate. So if, if you want to get involved, the um, easiest way as a chaser is to go to the online resources and go to the Soda Watch. And when this screen comes up over on the left, it shows you all of the people who have put a spot out on the website to let you know that they're somewhere on the summit transmitting now. And I think Soda did a really good job of setting this up, but there's even a better site that draws from the database called the Soda Atlas. And this has the same information. I just think they present it in a slightly better way. So if you wanted to get involved in Soda as a chaser, you would go to this website and click on spots. And these are the folks that are currently transmitting from summits around the world. As you can see, there's a gentleman in this top line here. There's a gentleman in Japan right now who's transmitting on 18 megahertz using CW. And that is a one point summit. I'll explain how we get the, the points for the summits in a, in a moment. The points for the summits around the world are 10 points, 8.6, 4, 2, and 1. And there are a couple of awards in SOTA. For chasers, there's one called the, the Shack Sloth Award. And you can win that when you've accumulated 1,000 chaser points. So for if you're chasing people on 10-point summits, you could earn that award as quick as chasing 100 summits um, probably takes a little bit longer for most people because you don't have the benefit of chasing people who are all activating on 10 point summits. And if you contact somebody, the website has a way to log those, com those contacts. You come back to the summits on the air website and go to the database. Give a moment to to come up. This is where all of the um, activity for soda is logged. And if you don't have an account in the upper right, you can just click on register. It's free, quick and easy. I have an account, so I'm just going to click on login and log in to the site. And if you had contacted somebody on a summit, you would come here to log 
your contact, you would go to Summit Log and submit chaser entry. There are about 100 associations around the world. SOTA is in about 100 countries. And the reason there's so many associations is, for instance, the fourth call district has Alabama, Carolinas, Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. So just in the fourth call district here in the United States, there are four associations. So let's say Ron Ritchie was activating in the Shenandoah National Park. You would come to the um, Whiskey Four Victor Association, which is Virginia. And I know in the Shenandoah National Park that Ron was up on, say, Stay Man. You would click in the date and the time. I'm not going to enter all these. You put in your call sign and um, for RKA called sign, you put in the band and the mode. He's going to be on sideband, I think, at that frequency. And you would click, click on submit log. And that's all there is to logging a chaser entry for someone that's on the air. And if you go back to the chaser role of honor, your activity would show up here. There's um, a gentleman down in southwestern Virginia, Whiskey 4 DOW. He has chased 6,800 summits. He has earned that Shaq's Loth Award 37 times over for 37,000 points. I've been working at this for about 14 months. I primarily chase activators just to give back to the program. So in the state of Virginia, I have chased 151 summits for 1,087 points. So I've earned that um, Shaq Sloth Award in about 14 months here, here in Virginia. So if you are interested in going further with SOTA and you actually want to activate, then the, um, I'll go back to the database in a second, but I wanted to give you an idea how a summit is defined and what the activation zone is in Virginia. If you wanna go up to a summit, hike up there with your equipment and activate a summit. So SOTA goes by the prominence of the summit to determine whether or not it qualifies or not. So if you look over on the left, you will see that there's a summit that's 900 feet high and down in the valley, the elevation is 300 feet above sea level, and that gives that particular summit 600 feet of prominence. You need at least 500 feet of prominence for a summit to qualify for soda. Carter's Mountain is actually a, a summit that qualifies here in the Charlottesville area. Buck's Elbow qualifies as a soda summit. Piney Mountain, some of the summits that you may be interested in uh, or, or know about around the Charlottesville area. Now the, the summit in the center does not qualify because even though it's a thousand feet, it's higher than the summit to the left, but you'll know that it only has 150 feet prominence. So it does not qualify for a soda summit. And of course the one on the right has the necessary prominence and it qualifies for a soda summit. So if you want to get involved with activating I'm gonna show you how to go about selecting a summit, the quick planning about how to get there, and we'll come back and we'll talk about the equipment that you need to take just a little bit, and um, then we'll take a few questions at the end. So if we go back to the, the SOTA Atlas, and we look at the region, and by the way, this SOTA Atlas has a map that shows you all of the soda summits in the world. The highest summits, 10 points, are red. The orange summits are the ones that are eight points. And the uh, yellow are six, and the green are the four, two, and one. And if, if you zoom out, you can get an idea of the distribution of all the qualifying soda summits on North America. There are 150,000 summits in the world that are currently designated for soda, 
um, it, it's in a hundred countries currently. There are more coming on all the time. There's some, some countries now that uh, don't have any uh, soda, soda activity. So 150,000 summits and about 35,000 or so have been activated. So not even a third of the summits at this point have been activated. So if you're interested in activating a summit, let's choose one here in the Shenandoah National Park. And the one I'd like to pick is Stony Man. It's in the central section of the Shenandoah National Park. And if you click on the summit, it brings up a page about Stony Man. And you'll see that since I am logged in across the top, you have the, the name of the mountain and the soda designator, Whiskey for Victor. It's in the Shenandoah um, region of the Whiskey for Victor Association. And it's the second highest summit in uh, that region in Virginia at 4,000 feet. It's a 10 point summit as we talked about before. And the plus three means that in Virginia, there's a bonus season from December 1st until March 15th. If you go up and activate Stony Man during that time, they add on three points for the bonus season for uh, cold weather or the difficulty of getting there in the winter. And the rest of the year, if you go up, it's just 10 points. Incidentally, if you went up in August and you earned the 10 points outside of the bonus season, you could actually go back in December inside the bonus season and earn the three additional points. So in each year, you can earn the points for a summit once per calendar year, December, um, January 1st through December 31st is the calendar, calendar year they run and you can earn the points once per year. Now for, for chasing, um, by the way, you can, you can earn the points once per day, but activating is just once per year. A couple other things you see across the top here, Stony Man has been activated 97 times times by me and I have actually chased people on that summit seven times. If you scroll down a little bit, you will see that here are the actual activations, the two that I've done on Stony Man, August of 2019 and again August just uh, two months ago. It gives you all of the, the QSOs, so where I showed you where we're entering in the data and the log, It'll show up here, you can click on that. It'll show you the 32 QSOs that I made from Stony Man back in August. I made all of those on two meter FM. I set up just about the time Lenny uh, N4LXP finishing on the summit here at the top. He was on a separate summit. I chased him on that summit from Stony Man. And um, I stayed up on that summit while he broke down all of his equipment and he hiked off the summit he was on and I'll scroll down here to the bottom and you'll see that I actually worked him again. While I was up there, he hiked over and activated another summit. Stayed up there the whole time and um, chased Lenny summit to summit twice while I was on Stony Man. Uh, here are all the um, activations, all the people that have activated Stony Man. It gives you a lot of data about the, uh, the QSOs per band. Everything from 80 meters to 10 meters has been used on Stony Man. I don't see a representation for six meters, but two meters, 220 and 440 has been used. And um, summits on the air, of course, started in Great Britain in 2002, but it came to the States in 2011. So it'll show you how many activations per year um, have been um, on, on Stony Man. So if you want to go and activate the summit, there are a lot of resources here. And I'm just gonna take the time to show you two real quick if you have an interest in going up and activating some summit like Stony Man. This is part of the, uh, the planning. There are a lot of ways to go, go about it, but I think mine is the, uh, the quickest and the easiest. And the first thing I do, I click on Google Maps and it brings up the summit in Google Maps, the GPS coordinates of the summit. And I pretty much ignore everything on this screen 
and click on directions and I put in the zip code where I live in Ivy. And I let Google Maps pull up a general route to drive to Stony Man. It says it's about 60 miles away and it's gonna take me roughly an hour and a half to get there. And part of the plan to go and activate a summons to allow yourself enough drive time and a hiking time because if you're going to let people know you're going to be on the summit at a given time, you want to show up at the time that you said you're going to show up. Otherwise, people are going to give up on you if you're always late or you never show up and do what you say you're going to do. So you want to put this into your planning. Part of it is knowing how long it's going to take you to drive to the summit. And it's going to take at least an hour and a half. I would allow two hours to drive to Stony Man. Maybe you need to get gas on the way. If you need to make a pit stop, I would allow two hours of driving time. And for the Shenandoah National Park, I usually back out my home zip code and I click on where the entrance station is. So you're going to enter at the Swift Run Gap. And the reason I click there is that I want to know how many miles I'm going to have to drive in the Shenandoah National Park to get to that summit because uh, you'll, you'll want to know that. It's roughly 20, I'm not clicking this in the right spot, but it's roughly 20 some miles to get to the, to the summit once you get into the Shenandoah National Park. The speed limit's 35, so you're gonna want it, you got plenty of time to wonder how many miles you have left getting to your summit. Now, the other thing that I click on here, and this is probably the absolutely most important thing I'm going to show you for going out and activating the summit because I would like to make a, a strong point about the fact that safety is the most important thing when you go out and you activate a summit. It is key importance. You need to get to the summit and home safe at the end of the day. And this is extremely important. I go back to this resource here and I click on the California Topo Maps. Don't ever go in the woods unless you print out your own topographic map. And the good thing about this is you can print out a custom map just for your hike. I go up here to the top, I click on print, and I go down to print to a PDF file. It pulls up, I'll zoom out just a little bit. Hopefully the computer is keeping up with this. I zoom out just a little bit. It gives you this red box. I drag it around and tell it encompasses my hike. Here is Stony Man, and here is a good reference of the Skyline Drive. And once I have the region that I want, I go to the lower left and I click on generate PDF file. And I print this out. And I never go hiking in the woods unless I have a hard copy, customized map, topo map of my hike. I take this. If I think it's going to rain, I'll put it in a Ziploc bag to seal it up so it won't get wet. But I never, ever, ever hike <clears throat> a topo map for the summit I'm going to. This is of key importance, and it should never be far away from your compass. I don't care what you use when you go hiking, whether you use a, a GPS or your cell phone, or you navigate the stars or the sun, or you think moss on the north side of the tree is the best way to find your way around. Don't ever, ever go in the woods without a topo map printed out and your compass. It's one of the most important things. The other tool that's here, if you click on Stony Man and you zoom in just a little bit and you go over here to the right, this tool right here will measure your hike. And I know from the parking lot the hike begins here and you stretch this out. You don't have to, you don't have to follow every little contour, but get just to the straight tangents. And I know the hike follows just about this path to the summit of Stony Man. It's about three quarters of a mile. It's not a long hike. So in planning to go and activate Stony Man, I'm gonna allow two hours to drive and park in the parking lot. I'm gonna allow an hour to get my backpack on and hike up to the summit and stretch out whatever antennas I feel are necessary for the activation. 
and I'm going to allow an extra hour to hike in the woods. So basically, if I'm going to leave home at nine o'clock to activate Stony Man, I'm going to tell people that I'll be up there at noon. And I feel very comfortable that I can drive and hike to the summit in that amount of time. And, um, and people, people can expect to hear me on the air by noon. Now, some of the equipment that you want to take up on the mountain, um, it's up to you entirely <laughs> as far as what you decide to take to the summit. There are some safety considerations and there are some equipment considerations. If you want to hike in with um, a QRP setup and be low power, you might have less weight than if you go in with the equipment I take. But um, it's, it's a matter of how much you want to carry to the summit. So uh, before we get to the gear, I just want to go over, again, a couple safety considerations. And the source at the bottom was the REI.com website. These are supposedly the most recent essentials for the minimum things you need to take with you before you get into ham radio equipment. And I'm just going to go over them real quick. And I think they leave out one that is more important than all of this here. It's really not an essential on the trail, but it's something you need to do before you hike. But let me just go over these real quick. The navigation I covered um, as far as uh, the topo map, you want to have one of those with you and you want to have a compass. Your GPS device is great. If you need some sort of a personal locator beacon, those things are great. But the most important thing you can have is that topo map and a compass. It doesn't hurt to have a headlamp. A lot of times you're going to start out in the morning. It's unlikely that you would um, stay until dark. But if you ever get delayed for whatever reason, it's not a bad idea to have a lamp with you. Sun protection, long sleeve, long sleeve shirt or hat, basic first aid. Uh, number five is a knife. I really don't like that because I think today we have so many uh, multi-tools available that includes a knife. Um, pliers and uh, a number of other tools. They're not that heavy, like a Swiss army knife, something that um, gives you the capability to maybe tighten a screw or loosen a bolt, something a little more than enough. I think they're on the wrong, the right track with a knife, but I think for the same amount of weight, you can carry something that has more functionality. If, um, if you get lost, uh, you have to spend the night in the woods, it's always good to have matches, some shelter, Really just a lightweight tarp, it's not a bad idea. If you're out in the summer, rain comes along, you can put up a shelter and um, keep your gear dry while it rains. Food, water, um, extra clothing, that's um, based on what you you feel you need. Certainly more water in the summer, less in the winter. Um, it's usually about 10 degrees cooler in the mountains here in Virginia. So if you start out down here in the Charlottesville area in a short sleeve shirt, you might want a long sleeve shirt by the time you get to the summit. And the one thing this whole 10 points of essentials leads out, leads out is that even before you go and get in the woods, you should file a hiking plan with a uh, responsible party that's going to check on you if you don't show back up at the time that you've determined. And this is important even if you're hiking with someone else. Um, Two people can get lost and delayed just as easily as one person. So it's a good idea to follow a hiking plan with somebody who's responsible. So equipment, this is just what I use. There are a lot of things to consider when you're going to set up on the mountaintop. I use the Yezu 857D. It's um, 100 watts of transmitting power from 160 meters through 10. It also has six meters, two meters, and 440. So I have a lot of capability on the summit. Two meters of course is um, 50 watts and um, 440 I think is 35. And generally I run pretty low wattage um, starting out. And um, up on the summits, I, I don't tend to use uh, a lot of high power. The batteries I use, I take two 12 volt, seven amp hour Dakota lithium life before batteries. They're about two pounds. Per battery, I could most likely 
get by with one. When I, when I activated Elliot Knob back in May, I was on the air for about, I guess, about 90 minutes. I worked about 32 stations. I was trying to uh, work a station down in North Carolina, so I put my rig on uh, 50 watts VHF, and I forgot about it. So I did all the, uh, all the transmitting at high power on VHF, and over about roughly 90, 90 minutes, 32 QSOs, I used about a third capacity with two batteries. Why would I want more capacity than what I may use for an activation? And by the way, to activate a summit, take the points you need to make a minimum of four, four QSOs. I always try to make as many contacts as I can because there are a lot of people out there interested in chasing, and I try to make the summit available to as many people as I can. And why do I want more capacity than necessary? Well, these batteries are also your safety device. If uh, something happens in the woods and you can need to continue to use radio for yourself, hopefully you can get out, maybe a repeater, maybe simplex, maybe some help on simplex if you need it. And um, if you come up to a hiker that's injured, you should always have more power in your batteries than you need just for the activation, for the safety. I also always hike with an HT. The Yezu radio I have is two meters and 440. I usually make sure I know the local repeaters so that I can reach them with my HT if necessary. It also, this Yezu runs a PRS. So I can beacon out my position to people. I can also beacon out a email uh, to let people know I might be delayed. Maybe I'm not gonna be back in time for the, um, uh, the hiking plan. I have filed with the responsible party. Maybe I'm delayed, but I'm fine. I can get a message out. Also, you can send out a spot uh, through APRS to let the world know that you're on site. And um, this, is a, this is a typical setup um, with my batteries and the radio. I use a paper log on a clipboard. People use uh, a to take that needs a battery, so I use good old fashioned paper. The HF antenna I use, it's, it's coiled up over to the left. It's kind of hard to show that in a picture stretched out, but it's a linked dipole. I can stretch it out and work 20, 30, and 40 meters. Recently, I've added a little link onto each end, and I can use 80 meters to reach some people that enjoy chasing uh, up and down the Shenandoah Valley when I'm out of range for VHF. This is uh, just showing the backpack. I usually take a, a cushion so I can sit on something. Um, the important thing here is the, I'm just gonna go back one slide if this thing will let me, uh, maybe it won't, but the, here we go. The, the plastic box over on the right is of key importance for your radio. You wanna put your radio into in something that will protect it from ambient vibration in your backpack and will protect it from water. If you get caught out in the rain or if you're crossing a stream and for some reason you have a spontaneous urge to go swimming, the uh, plastic box will hopefully protect your rig. It's also a great thing to set your rig up on the, um, on the ground. You're up on a summit. They're not generally picnic tables up there waiting for you for your comfort. So you got to take what you get and usually that plastic box like this will help you set your radio up off the ground, hopefully keeping twigs and junk out of your radio. So on HF, I use an arrow antenna. Um, it's a four element arrow. The boom breaks down into three sections and the elements, which are actually arrow shafts, unscrew and all that fits into my backpack. I have a carbon fiber telescopic pole that I set up. It goes up to about 20 feet. Here I have it. Here I'm set up on a peak down near uh, the Peaks of Otter. Yeah, it's a hot day. You can see I've already hung up my uh, sweaty shirt <laughs> on the clothesline to dry out. I usually take an extra shirt. It's nice to change into something dry when you do a summit. But uh, all of that packs down into my backpack. Uh, this is my general setup VHF. Of course, I stretch it out even higher for HF if I'm on a summit where I can't get my, the center of my dipole up in a tree. Usually if I get my dipole about 18, 20 feet, it's pretty good to, to go. So um, this is a picture of my VHF arrow. 
on the, the left boom. And um, I've recently gotten a 220 megahertz arrow to work people locally on 220 since there's a lot of 220 activity around here. Um, the coax didn't exactly run right, but this was just for illustration purposes. I actually had some high SWRs. I got that 220 antenna close to the, uh, to the pole for whatever reason. And uh, I just offset it a little bit and SWR is, is down low. So um, that's my setup for two meters and 220. This is a uh, peak I activated just last week down at the um, Burke's Garden near Taswell in southwestern Virginia. I'm set up for, um, I've got my carbon fiber pole set up with my two meter antenna. I've got it staked out with some rope um, guy wires and um, you can't see it, but I also have the dipole stretched out. I worked Ron back in Charlottesville on 80 meters. I work people um, around the US on 20 meters and a number of local folks on two meters, which is always fun to talk to the locals. This was the, the view I had looking out over Burke's garden. And the paper log that I take, it's one I made myself across the top. I usually put the, the summit I'm gonna activate. This was Cal Knob, I, was gonna get to, I didn't get to it, but um, I put the name of the summit there, the soda designator, the elevation, and I put the GPS coordinates on there. It's always good to have that. If for some reason you get lost, it's great to know where the summit is located based on GPS. Somebody will invariably ask you for the grid square. It's nice to know that you're in Fox Mike 08. If they ask you for the KQ, you got it right there at your fingertips. It's also nice to know that you're in Rockingham County. A little research you can do if people ask you, where, where is Cal Na? Oh, well, it's in Rockingham County. It's the George Washington National Forest. It's right on the border of West Virginia. It's on the Shenandoah Mountain. People will be like, oh yeah, yeah, I know exactly where that is. It's also good to have a distance. That measuring tool we saw in the Soda Atlas, stretch it out from say Harrisonburg up to Cal Na, and you know you're about 21 miles to the northwest of um, Harrisonburg. People ask for this when you're on the summit. The compass I use, is this particular one. Um, reason I have the mirror is not so much for <laughs> its feature. Uh, although it's nice for sighting, I don't generally use that much, but I, I like gear that has more than one feature. And if you ever get a gnat in your eye, it's, uh, it just hurts uh, and it'll irritate the heck out of you. So if you have a mirror, it's great to be able to look into that and um, help yourself on a trail to get a gnat out of your eyes. So it's more than just navigation. This is a beautiful view from Hawksville and the Shenandoah National Park, looking over the, the Shenandoah Valley. Um, real quick, I don't wanna take up too much time, but there are um, some apps for your cell phone, the Soda, Soda Spotter on the um, Android and the Soda Goat on the, um, the iPhone. They do everything I showed you in that Soda Atlas. You can, you can put out a spot and let people know around the world that you're on a summit now transmitting and you can put out, um, and you can also see who else is, is transmitting around you if they're taking the time to put the information on the internet. Ham GPS is a good free app. You can plug in the coordinates, the GPS coordinates, of the summit that you're going to, and it'll help guide you to the summit. Most summits in Virginia have a trail, not all. Some, some don't have a tra trail to the summit at all, and you're on your own. This is, a, this is a good guide, assuming your cell phone's working. I wouldn't 100% rely on it. Good. I would take the topographic map and the compass. There's also, I think there's a comparable one on the iPhone, but there's the PRS Droid. You can run APRS on your smartphone through the cell towers and you can beacon out your position so people at home can get an idea where you're located and how close you're getting to the summit. Of course, that's only as good as the nearest cell phone tower, so it doesn't always work perfectly on the summit, but it's a tool. I like the hand block. I can set it up on my cell phone and for logging the time, I can just look right at it and know where I am. There's a soda finder 
this will um, pull your GPS location and tell you what summits are in proximity to your current GPS location. And the repeater book app is really great because it pulls your GPS coordinate and tells you what repeaters are closest to you. That's great when you get to the parking lot. And if you're unfamiliar with an area, you can look at repeater book. Again, your GPS coordinate tells you how close the uh, adjacent repeaters are. And you can plug them in and see if they're up and running before you ever start hiking. So it's a safety feature for the repeater book app. I think I had the droid slide in there twice. Um, this is a picture driving up to the beginning of the hike for Elliott Knob back in May. The scenery here in Virginia is just incredible. This is my mother. She's 83 years old. She, I've invited her on um, many activations with me. She's hiked to about 30, I guess 35 summits now. I've done 73. She's hiked to 35, 83 years old, loves to hike. Quite the adventurous lady. This is um, Three Ridges down in Nelson County back in May, Harkening Hill down near the uh, Peaks of Otter. And um, this is on White Top Mountain. I was just there last week down southwestern Virginia. This is about three miles away from Mount Rogers, which is the highest peak in Virginia, but this particular one, White, uh, White Top Mountain, is about 5,500 feet here in Virginia. And um, this was down on Cole Mountain in Nelson County, uh, set up with my two meter four element Yagi. And you'll note the front of the, the Yagi is tied down. <laughs> So it's, this is right on the Appalachian Trail. You see the white blaze there in front of you. And uh, if I didn't have the front tied down, the, uh, the uh, Yagi was spinning around like a weather vane. And this is down near um, Lexington on Little House and Big House Mountains. So, um, John, how are we doing on time? Are you muted? I, I am muted. Uh, uh, I think we've uh, got a. You can do a, a few more minutes there if you if you need them. But uh, we okay, can also with questions if you'd like. Yeah, I want to tailor this to the uh, to the meeting. I don't want to take up too much time. This this is just a typical setup. Again, you see that plastic box that I use to protect my rig from abrasion and the weather. Sometimes I just use it for a setup when there aren't a lot of other options. So. Um, that's kind of a, a real quick overview of summits on the air. Remember, if you go back to the, um, the website, there's a lot of information about joining in, introduction to chasing, introduction to activating. And if you want to um, learn more about Virginia, click on the associations. It shows you that there's 182 in the world. Just remember you're in Whiskey Fort Victor for Virginia. If you click on that, here is the association reference manual. And everything I went over and more is available in this manual. It's about 31 pages. The first 20 goes over safety and how the summits are rated here in Virginia. Um, the points, one point through 10 points based on the various elevations. It goes over the bonus season there are some specific wards to Virginia. So at your leisure, that's available on the Summits on the Air website. So that's my quick overview. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, we had a few questions that came in on the chat line. Maybe we could go over some of those. Uh, uh... Absolutely. Uh, from Patrick, um... Does Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania qualify? I climbed it last year. Picture of me on the climb. I suspect it does. I suspect Kilimanjaro does. Um, Larry, that's what kind? That's in. Um, is that in Kenya? Uh, I think it's, it's in Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania, that's correct. Tanzania. Well, keep asking the questions and yeah, i'll go we'll, 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 we'll zoom check over it out. we'll, we'll, we'll check zoom it out. over to africa real quick and we'll see i Can expect you, it is 
Can you give us the website for the topo map again? I guess that was a uh, Patrick uh, Donahue gave uh, gave us that question. Uh, that was certainly interesting as well. That, that topo map is amazing. I really am pleased to see that. Okay, Larry, your first question, Tanzania. You see mm -hmm. the screen? Yeah. I don't see any summits in Tanzania. Okay. So well. I don't think they're set up in that country yet. I suspect the summit qualifies, but I oh, don't yeah. believe they have an active so association in Tanzania. So it's, yes, it's a soda summit, but no, it's not active in the program. I noticed uh, earlier that you and you gave us kind of the world map effect. Uh, I was looking at Turkey uh, and it didn't look like uh, there was any uh, activity there either. Uh, I had a uh, old extinct uh, volcano adjacent to my Peace Corps town location called Mount Ergius and uh, many, many fond memories of being up on that mountain itself, but uh, no, it, I'm sure it's not listed as a, a sort of thing, but it's something for the future that is uh, that is interesting indeed. Uh, I was surprised how many summits there were in Iceland. Yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, there's more than a thousand summits in, in Iceland, but uh, the topo thing, any summit you click on, when you come up to this page, there's this uh, option here to open. And mm -hmm. if you click on that, there are all of these resources here. And um, actually, I, I don't see California Topo because I think it's just in the United States. Let me go back. Let's go home real quick. And I think uh, I think that Topo feature is just in the United States because I'm not seeing it. But you see, if you click on the open, and here is California Topo, that's mm -hmm. where you bring up the topographic map that is specific to your hike. And from there, you just click on print at the top of the screen, print to PDF, and it goes to the screen that allows you the option to um, configure this, customize it is the word I'm looking for to your summit. And then once you have the area that you want, the lower left, you click on generate PDF and the map will come up yeah. so that you can print that. And you can also download that as a PDF to your your smartphone, but I always prefer the printed out copy and I never go hiking without one. We had a question from uh, Mike KQ9P, are all soda peaks on public land? How is permission handled? Are there any good resources for obtaining permission? No, um, all, all soda summits are not on public land. They, they go based on that um, 500 feet of prominence. So I would say in Virginia, the, the higher the summit, the more likely it is to be on public land, and the lower the summit, the more likely it is to be on um, private land. That's not a hard and fast rule, but I expect it's uh, a, a general guideline. But what, the, would you, uh, what would you do, Alan, if it's uh, on uh, private land? Uh, how do you obtain permission? You, you would have to, um, of course, SUDA does not condone trespassing on land, so this is a great question. You, you have to get permission from the landowner. So yeah. if the uh, if the summit in, is in proximity to a, a house, you may take a wild stab in the dark and go knock on the door and see if the, uh, <laughs> the landowner is the one who answers the door. If not, you would have to go to the tax records of the county that that particular summit is in. You would have to track down the landowner and find a phone number or send them a letter and actually get permission to go and activate the summit. There's a, um, a summit out here in Northern Albemarle called Pasture Fence Mountain. I had just gotten permission to activate Pasture Fence Mountain. I'm gonna be going up there in January. It's private land and mm -hmm. permission is through um, someone who knows the owner, it's related to the owner and I'll get to go up there in January. But without that permission, I wouldn't be able to go up there because it's private land and it's not always easy to find the owner. So. It is a challenge if you're going on a summit that's not public property. We have a question from Dave KN for UEK. Uh, can you be successful in SOTA with QRP? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there, there, any, any QRP that you do anywhere else, I mean, you're just as likely to be as successful on a summit with QRP is anywhere else. In fact, there are a lot of people that go the QRP route. The equipment for QRP 
is certainly uh, <laughs> weighs a lot less than the Yezu 857D that I use for my activations. And, it, um, you know, radios like the Elecraft, um, there's some other radios that are also, you know, five watts or, or less that are very lightweight QRP rigs, and you can be very successful. And some even go lighter, like the uh, Steve Gouchet out in Colorado, the guy who uses the goats as his pack mules. He's almost exclusively doing CW. So some of the rigs for CW can be as small as a matchbook and mm -hmm. send out milliwatts. So that's a very lightweight uh, to, to go with a QRP rig. And um, yes, you can be very successful with that. Ian Callahan, KN4TBG, uh, says, look up a county GIS system. Could, that could help locate the owner of that property. Yes, uh, just about just about any county has a geographic um, information system for the tax records, and mm -hmm. that's a great source to find the landowner and usually a mailing address. And then uh, KK4JP, good old John, he comes and says, how distant can your station be from the highest point on the summit? <sighs> how far... Do you have to be right at the peak, I guess? Uh, oh, I, I got, I, yeah, yeah. Um, the activation zone for the summit is 25 meters. So you, you need to be hmm. uh, 82, 80 meters from the summit. So like a wedding cake, the top tier, uh, the top of the peak, the, the highest point, 82 feet down is where you need to be for the activation zone. So for some summits, that can be an absolutely huge area. And if you're in a situation like you're talking about where you're trying to get permission for a summit, sometimes the absolute peak is private property, but you can be 50 feet down. And now maybe you're in the Shenandoah National Park where the borderline is, you can successfully activate that summit 50 feet below in Shenandoah National Parkland, where the summit might be private property. So the, the activation zone is 25 meters or 82 mm. feet below the highest point. A couple of questions here, uh, Alan. Uh, Tim asks, um, have, what is your pack weight? And Jim Wilson's asking, have you ever gotten lost? <laughs> Well, as, as a general rule, your pack weight, uh, a comfortable pack weight for humans is about 10% of your body weight. That's not hard and fast. It's a rule of thumb. My pack weight ranges somewhere around 20 pounds to 25. There's some marginal weight with, um, on a hot day, I carry more water. So I'm starting heavier, I'm coming back lighter, but I'm somewhere around 20 to, um, to 25 pounds. And um, is, <laughs> as far as getting lost, the answer, the short answer to that is no. I have never gotten lost in the woods. The long answer is I was out in Western Augusta in the summer hiking to a peak called Friesland Flat. It's in the uh, Ramsey Draft uh, Wilderness. And the summit is a five mile hike off the road. And you are literally probably in Virginia about as far away from civilization and as help as you can be. And I had a double of a time getting to the summit because it's five miles on good trail. And the last half mile to the summit is um, without a trail, bushwhacking through really tough territory. And I decided I was gonna hike out a different way with no trail and I was going to find a better way to get to the summit. I got delayed, the terrain was worse. A thunderstorm um, came over top of me. I had to deal with the thunderstorm while I was in the woods. My GPS um, uh, sent me in the wrong direction because of the, the leaf cover. The repeater on Elliott Knob that Tim owns, KG4HOT, I was gonna use that to call out to let people know I was gonna be late. That went down during my hike because the thunderstorm knocked the power out and I couldn't get out. Finally, I overstayed my water. So I hiked down really low to a stream to replenish my water supply. By then I was, uh, the terrain was too steep to hike back out. So I hiked out 
on the um, on the stream bed. And meanwhile, my um, my backup, my uh, person that I filed a hiking plan with, alerted to the folks that were supposed to come look for me. And Lenny and for LXP came to the Ramsey Draft parking lot because I was past due. And I picked him up on Simplex, uh, two meters. Um, I was about a mile from the trail. He was calling out to see if I was all right because he verified my car was in the parking lot. So I wasn't specifically lost, but I have certainly had fun with my own. Yeah, uh, that sounds right. Uh, Michael Ellington asked, uh, can a station be an activator for soda and POTA simultaneously? Oh, absolutely. Whatever, um, whatever award program you're looking for, you can do both of those or more simultaneously. And I've got one final uh, here. It's Patrick Donahue says, what wildlife have you encountered? Uh, it shows you what he's thinking of. Bear, coyote, fox. I'm, I would add snakes. Well, I've, I've seen a lot of deer. Uh, I've seen a black snake. I haven't seen the cottonmouth or the rattlesnakes that we hear about in Virginia. I did see a bear. I was hiking over to Fork Mountain one morning and it was a um, fern thicket and a, a bear jumped up about, I don't know, maybe 50 yards away. And I guess I, I guess I woke the bear up and it ran off. So that was my experience with the bear. It's hard to be scared of something that runs away from you. That's right. Well, Benjamin uh, was probably the, the one who did the proper thing here. He raised his hand. I definitely need to uh, call on him. Uh, KG4EIF, uh, you have a question. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Allen. Hey, hey, Benjamin. We have a question for you. Okay, you got, Seth? you got Seth there with you? He's right here. Hey, right hey here. Seth. And they beat on the story. Hi, Mr. Allen. Absolutely. Good, good to hear you guys on here today. What's, your, what, what's the question? My question is, what was the first um, mountain you did ham radio on? I did the um, Stony Man in the Shenandoah National Park. It's the second highest summit in the Shenandoah National Park. Easy walk. You guys should try it. Very good. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's wrap this up. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions that we need to have? It's urgent, urgent, urgent. But uh, I think that everyone uh, appreciates your input, Alan.